Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Matrix. Do you want to know what it is? The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window, or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. When The Matrix first came out, it was praised highly for its originality and thought-provoking message. But when you dig a little deeper, you realize that The Matrix wasn't such an original idea after all. In fact, the idea of The Matrix is ancient. It predates television, electricity, and even the English language. And as great a job as he does in that movie, Lawrence Fishburne is not the original Morpheus. So I'm going to offer you a third pill, the Naples Ultra pill, and introduce you to the original Morpheus. You've probably heard of him before. Lived a long time ago in an ancient Mediterranean society. Of course, I'm talking about our good friend, Plato. Granted, Plato's ideas are not explained in the exact same way as they are in the movie, but its core themes are strikingly similar. In fact, the creators of The Matrix openly admitted to drawing upon Plato's cave analogy for their movie. What is the cave analogy, you ask? Or metaphor? I just kind of use them interchangeably. Well... That is what we're going to be talking about today. It is the prehistorical matrix, if you will. This prehistorical matrix appears in what is Plato's most influential and popular work, The Republic. So, Socrates starts by explaining the metaphor of the cave. He starts by talking about the prisoners who are shackled and they can't move and they're watching these shadows move across in front of them. And because they've been in this cave, shackled and imprisoned all their lives, they have no idea what reality actually looks like. So they think their little outcove is the real world. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Socrates slash Plato I'm just going to keep calling him Socrates, even though we know it's written by Plato. Anyway, Socrates says that even if we were to unshackle these prisoners and they were to walk up and stare out into the light, it would be an extremely uncomfortable experience for them. So they would rather choose the option of staying in the cave rather than going out into the light if given the choice. So if we're going to bring these people out of their prison into reality, we have to do it forcibly. We literally have to go in there and drag them out. And that's not an experience they're going to enjoy very much. They're going to be angry, they're going to be resentful, and they're going to be confused. And he's not going to adjust to reality overnight. It's going to take him some time. Because he's been living in darkness for so long, he has to take 
this adjustment in steps. At first, he's only going to be able to see shadows, and then dark figures. Then he'll be comfortable with the light at nighttime, until finally, over time, his eyes have adjusted enough that he can finally look up at the sun during the day and realize that the sun in one form or another is responsible for everything he's experienced up to this point, including the light which made the shadows on the wall. There is a line that appears in some translations of the Republic where Socrates says, the only way to reason the sun is to be able to see the sun. And it's a shame that quote doesn't show up in this translation because I think it's a good way of explaining what he means. But we'll come back to this in a bit. Socrates says that our prisoner who we have forcibly dragged up out of the cave will eventually be happy that we did what we did. When looking back on his experience in the cave, the prisoner will be thankful that even though there are toils in the world which he inhabits now that never existed in the cave, he will be happy to be free and living in reality rather than wishing he was back in the cave with the guys who are watching the shadows go by and getting prizes and honors for guessing the right shadows. None of that means anything to him anymore because he knows what's truth and what's fiction. It gets interesting again when Socrates says that if our prisoner were to return to the cave, all the other prisoners would belittle him. They would chastise him because he's no longer accustomed to that environment. He can no longer engage with the shadows once he knows that they are shadows. And the other prisoners, upon seeing that he's no longer able to engage with these shadows, think that he's completely ruined his life that he's just messed everything up, and he's effectively become a total loony in the eyes of his former prisoners. As a result of this, the prisoners that are now in the cave completely rule out a journey upwards, even if they had the capability to do so, because they don't want their eyes to get ruined, and they don't want to ruin what they perceive as reality. And it's not like our freed prisoner can tell them what they're seeing isn't reality. They would never believe him. And they wouldn't have the words or the images or the cognition internally to be able to perceive what reality is, even if he told them. Then Socrates ends by saying that if these prisoners could, they would kill anybody who tried to remove them and bring them up to the surface. They would be extremely hostile to any attempts to actually bring reality into their lives. The whole purpose of this metaphor is to illustrate one thing. Socrates likens the sun in this metaphor to the good. He says that the good is the creator of all these other aspects that we're talking about. The creator of justice, of fairness, of good law, and so on and so forth. But seeing and interpreting the good is extremely difficult. Almost all of us, Socrates says, are stuck in this cave watching projections of these surrounding concepts of the good, but never knowing that they are just that. Projections. In order for us to actually build a truly just society, we need to understand the good itself. We have to allow someone to forcibly drag us out of our cave and into the light. And once we get into the light, it's going to take us some time to actually comprehend what the good is. We're not going to be able to see it right away. We're going to have to engage with these outer concepts and slowly but surely build up our understanding until eventually we can go out and look directly at the sun or the good in this metaphor and finally be able to reason it. Remember that line that I talked about earlier that didn't appear in our translation? In order to reason the sun, one must first see the sun, just replace the sun with good, and then the metaphor should become clear. In order to reason the good, 
we must first see the good. So, what's the whole point of this? What's the whole point of the metaphor? The end argument of the Republic is this. In order to build a truly just society, we have to build a society which understands the good. In order to understand the good, we need people who are willing to drag us out of the cave and do the difficult work in order to finally be able to see the good and reason the good. The people who have done this are the only ones who are capable of ruling over society because they are the only ones capable of creating a truly good society. So, the ideal society is one which is ruled over by a philosopher king of sorts or some council of wise elders that are able to understand the good. Basically, he's saying the perfect ruler would be someone like Plato. It's really great, right, that basically he writes this entire work of philosophy to argue that the only person capable of ruling society is himself. Now, to finish off this section of the show, I want to talk about the reason I decided to do this episode in the first place. More and more, I think the lines between reality and shadows on the wall are getting blurred. And, in fact, people are using shadows on the wall to obfuscate or engulf reality. To the point where we're spending all our time talking about the shadows on the wall rather than talking about the light. I see this especially with news organizations. For example, they will generate entire stories off of a shadow on the wall and put it right beside or in between extremely important stories that have a dramatic effect on our lives. As well, these shadows on the wall stories are generally placed with an engaging picture or clickbait title, so they end up sucking up all the oxygen in the room. As a result, there is less conversation surrounding issues which have a far greater impact on us all, and reality is not absorbed. The point here is clear. You cannot correlate shadows on the wall to actions in real life. Doing so only distracts us from issues in real life that we should be dealing with. The shadows on the wall only ruin reality when you let them distract you from the truth. With that being said, the whole purpose of this exercise is to get you guys asking yourselves. Next time you're reading a piece of reporting, make sure to ask yourself, is this a shadow on the wall or is it dealing with reality? This is a great filter to help you discover which pieces are worth your time and which are not. I don't stand.